afternoon, everyone. I can see we've got a good number of people joining. Thank you for coming along. I'll just give it just a second just as people click the buttons and are listening. I hope you're not in too much rain where you are. I'm happy to report we've got a little bit of sunshine in Cornwall. Probably won't last very long. Um, brilliant. So thank you all for being here. You know why we're here. We're here for a session with Jamie and Maria from Neurosites and talking about eliminating bias by using AI. Um, we'll do some introductions in a moment. Um, just a couple of things. We'll be here for about an hour and um, plenty of time for Q&A, um, at, at least 20 minutes. So please do pop your questions into the Q&A box and I'll come back at the end and I'll help facilitate those. Um, and the session is being recorded, so we'll be able to share this afterwards if you need any follow up. And I'm sure Jamie and Maria will share the slides so uh, without any further ado, Jamie, Maria, welcome to the webinar. I shall hand over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and hi, everybody. Thank you for, for joining today. I hope you're uh, enjoying your lunch breaks so far. Um, have some nibbles to hand. Um, I hope this is going to be a really informative and interesting session. We've put plenty of work and research into it for you to make it as informative as possible. And it's an important topic bias in assessment and selection. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so we're going to deep dive into the world of bias in assessment and selection in all its forms. It will be um, an eye-opening and occasionally candid and challenging insight session. It's an important topic. Um, and throughout the session, we'll be issuing um, various calls to action based on knowledge, research and outcomes that we've seen um, and these calls to action uh, for employers and the broader assessment industry um, are really designed to, 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 to move us all forward from the current status quo where bias is, is a pernicious influence in many forms of assessment. Um, for decades, the uncomfortable truth for, for many of us is that minority groups have been disadvantaged in assessment and selection processes. And we believe it's time for that discrimination to end and, and for decisive action to be taken to help move us to a, to a better place and realize that ambitious goal of removing bias. Now, in terms of the content for the session today, um, we'll do we'll very quick introductions, myself, and Maria um, from Neuroscience, and then we'll dive straight in to the specifics. So we'll talk about bias and adverse impact, um, definitions, accepted definitions and some challenges around that. We'll then deep dive into the specific types of assessment um, and how bias manifests itself in those various assessments with real world data and case studies. Um, and as we go through the session, we'll be illustrating and highlighting our five calls to action, which we'll summarize at the end, a tangible set of aspirations and actions that if implemented by employers and the assessment industry would radically enhance accessibility fairness and diversity outcomes. So very quick introduction. Um, I'm Jamie, founder of Neurosite, joined by Maria, director of talent science. Between us, we've worked with well over a third of the UK's top 100 employers over the last 15 years, developing and implementing end-to-end -end assessment solutions with a particular focus on early careers. And what that real world experience has given us is a really detailed understanding of exactly how those processes work and the specific diversity outcomes that they generate and where the particular challenges are. So as we go through this session today, we'll be leading partly into that real world experience as well as the latest academic research in the field. Uh, and we'll be highlighting many insights that we've gained um, over the last 15 years relating to bias and adverse impact. Um, so very quick introduction to Neurosite if you're not familiar with us. Um, we were established in 2019 as a response to the challenges encountered in traditional assessments. And in a nutshell, we combine um, uh, neuroscience and artificial intelligence to create online assessments that deliver very high accuracy and no bias in a short space of time. Now, I promise this is not going to be the neuroscience hard sell. Um, you know, um, our AI powered assessments are wonderful, of course, and I encourage you all to buy them. Um, however, um, this, the purpose of this session is not going to be meat selling neuroscience. We're going to dive straight into the main topic now, which is bias in assessment and selection. Let's dive in. 
So what do we mean, firstly, by bias? Well, um, fairly straightforward definition is the systematic tendency to favor or um, disfavor certain groups resulting in discrimination based on characteristics such as race, gender, disability, age, or other factors. Um, that's a fairly uncontroversial definition. Most people accept it. So um, that's a good starting point. In relation to bias in assessment and selection and what we're going to focus on today, it's fair to say that despite considerable efforts by employers and the assessment industry um, to eliminate bias, it, it, it persists and it remains highly problematic. Um, it does exist in all stages of the recruitment process, but there are some elements of assessment and selection that are more challenging than others, it's fair to say. So, for example, in the application stage, um, you know, employers can take concrete steps such as anonymizing applications um, for in-person assessments such as interviews. You, you can um, undertake things like you know, use structured behavioral interviews, unconscious bias training. We're not going to focus on that kind of low-hanging fruit in this in this session. We're going to dive into the really challenging aspects. Um, most employers that we speak to around this feel a sense of control around things like the application and in-person or virtual assessment stages. They feel they can influence the outcomes there, the diversity outcomes. The, the big challenge for employers is often the online assessment component. This is where the adverse impact or, or bias is often felt most strongly. Um, it's very challenging to fix. Uh, it's persisted for decades. <laughs> um, and when it comes to early careers hiring in particular, vast numbers of candidates are screened out using these assessments. So not only is it the most problematic from a bias perspective, it also has by far the biggest impact. Right, uh, you know, sometimes up to 90 or 95% of applicants are screened out using these various types of online assessments. So we'll be deep diving in this session into specific types of online assessment, what is driving that bias, what is driving those negative outcomes, and critically, what we can do about it. Um, so I hope that'll be really interesting. Now let's start with, with, with um, defining adverse impact because before we dive into the specifics of bias, this is a useful term to um, define and be comfortable with. So um, this is the phrase that perhaps many of you are familiar with, adverse impact, often defined by the four fifths rule. It's a popular method to detect bias in selection processes. Now it's a guideline, interestingly, that was originally introduced in the US um, to determine if selection processes had an impact on minority groups. And what it states as a rule is that if a minority group has a success rate less than 80% that of a majority group, that is adverse impact, right? It's a bit of a binary thing. It's either you, you've got it or you haven't. It was originally defined by the US Equal Employment Opportunities Commission uh, and placed into the Uniform Guideline on Employee Selection in 1978. So 40, a year I was born, 45 years ago. And when it was defined, it was, interestingly, it was only intended as a stepping stone at the time, and the commission makes that clear. Um, and yet, here we are, <laughs> 45 years later, and we're still using it as a kind of gold standard, which, interestingly, it was never intended to be. It was always intended to be a stepping stone towards eliminating bias, a compromise, and it was a compromise, and it was hotly debated at the time. And I think if the original members of the commission are still alive today, I don't know if they are or they aren't, but if they are, I think they'd be both surprised and a bit disappointed that we're still using it as a kind of gold standard for reasons we'll describe. So there are quite a few criticisms of the fourth fifth rule. This isn't just criticisms that I'm making. You know, the, 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 these are well understood, well discussed criticisms that were made at the time in 1978. Let's explore them. So, so one of the criticisms is. Um, that there is um, a significant tolerance for inequality. So if your selection process only has a 19% disparity between say black and white candidates, then according to the, the four fifth rules of adverse impact, there is no adverse impact, which feeds into another limitation. It's a binary measure. Either you've got adverse impact according to this definition or you, you haven't. And that, that tolerance for um, disparity um, some critics would suggest, and I'm, I'm very sympathetic to this view, that it legitimizes meaningful inequality in employment opportunity and selection processes. Um, and, and critics assert that the bar is, is simply set too low. 
that, that it allows um, statistically meaningful differences to exist between my, minority and majority groups. And it, in effect, it's a bit of a cop out, really. Um, and um, that's characterized by, by the phrase that it, it's insufficiently ambitious. Uh, the, the, the rule is not really ambitious enough. If we're serious about providing equal opportunity to all, then we want to go beyond the four fifths rule, right? I mean, wouldn't a great place to be um, to be um, in, in a situation where we don't have statistically significant performance differences between men, women, black, white, disabled, not disabled? Wouldn't that be something that's worth aspiring to? And I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to issue some, some calls to action that we think it would be beneficial to adopt, both for employers and the assessment industry. This is our first one. So our first call to action is let's aspire to do better than the four fifths rule. Right. Let's let's, you know, for employers and for the assessment industry, let's accept that this rule is insufficiently ambitious if we really care about equal opportunity, equal employment opportunity and removing bias. And if we're serious about it, we want to aspire to remove statistically meaningful differences between majority and minority groups. And that's the first call to action that we want to kind of put out there, first of five. Let's now explore, having defined the, the kind of how we're measuring adverse impact and the limitations of that rule, let's dive in specifically now into issues of bias in online assessments, having defined our terms and the yardsticks by which we're measuring success. Um, let's talk about the biggest diversity challenges in assessment and selection, probably by far, right, which is which is um, bias in online assessments and the impact that has. Here are some well accepted examples. This is well understood by employers and assessment providers as well. We know that verbal reasoning tests and tests like them adversely impact black candidates. We know that numerical reasoning tests and assessments like them adversely impact female candidates. We know that situational judgment tests and tests like them adversely impact candidates from low socioeconomic backgrounds. The reasons for that are complex, are interesting, and, and in some cases very concerning. Let's deep dive now into what is driving that bias, right? And we're going to start and hand over to Maria at this point. We're going to start with verbal reasoning and black applicants and what, what is driving that, that bias. Maria, over to you. Thank you, Jamie. Before I dive in, let me say that this might feel quite academic research heavy at times. Um, that's because we see these differences in scores for minority groups so often in our client experience. But the data we have from recruitment processes doesn't tell us why these differences happen. It just tells us that they do. So we must turn to academic research to actually understand the why. And thanks to the hard work in academia, our understanding evolves as practitioners every single day. So let's now dive into the causes of bias in VRTs for Black applicants, um, sorry, BME applicants, starting with cultural and language bias. This may sound incredibly obvious, um, but ethnic diversity is not just about skin color. There is a deep historical and cultural dimension. And one of the ways this transpires is through the beautifully rich and diverse language that is used by many cultures. For example, cultural linguistics research by John Rickford has shown that African-American vernacular English that is used by many African-Americans has its own unique grammatical structures and vocabulary, which can differ significantly from the standard um, American English that is used in many, many tests. Test developers need to be aware of these differences and take steps to ensure that their tests are both culturally and linguistically inclusive. But unfortunately, this is just not the case. Many verbal reasoning tests are designed and normed on predominantly white um, English speaking populations with no recognition of the wide variety of dialects out there. And so as a result, they end up applying a one size fits all lens on verbal reasoning, which disadvantages diverse indi individuals who are taking it. To compound that issue, a report from the Joseph um, Rowan Tree Foundation in 2020 shows us that around 45% of people in Black households were in poverty, compared to just 19% of people in white households. Think about that. This suggests that Black individuals were more than twice as likely to be in poverty than their white counterparts. And this clearly impacts the, asset, the access to education, resources, test preparation materials, even the time that these individuals have to prepare for such um, intensive tests. 
stereotype threat. Now, this is a really interesting psychological phenomenon where people underperform in response to the stress of negative stereotypes about their racial or ethnic group. So in this example, if back, if black applicants go into a test situation they're, um, and they are conscious of stereotypes about their racial or ethnic groups, intellectual abilities, their scores in similar tests, it will raise their anxiety levels. And there is a large body of research that shows that test anxiety significantly decreases test performance. So just to summarize, as a black person going into a verbal reasoning test, the odds are already feeling stacked against you. And those odds have nothing to do with your actual ability. It's also important to note that, you know, these causes of bias that I've mentioned here, stereotype threat, anxiety, socioeconomic factors, um, they don't just impact VRTs, they also impact many other tests. So I think the question that we need to ask ourselves is, is that fair? Is that reasonable? And I really think that no one here on this call can confidently answer yes to these questions. No one here can say that they're happy to see these differences. So Jamie will now share more about how the most often used ways of classifying and analyzing candidate data can be our enemy in the fight for equality and inclusion. Thank you, Maria. And yet sticking um, on the issue of um, ethnic um, bias in assessments. Um, one conclusion, and this links into our second call to action really, is that the term um, BME, often used in the UK as a catch-all term to describe people who are not of white British descent, uh, may not be that helpful when it comes to analyzing adverse impacts and bias in online assessments. Um, you know, the, the groups lumped together within the term BME are a vast array of ethnicities, cultures, experiences, each with their own unique contexts. Um, and this diversity extends to, to, to numerous factors, um, language, cultural norms, educational background, immigration status, socioeconomic conditions that can all affect um, experiences and outcomes. And grouping these diverse cultures under one term, BME, can mask significant differences between groups. Um, so, for instance, um, uh, studies show that South Asian, Southeast Asian and Black applicants all have very different metrics aligned to things like educational attainment, income, um, health outcomes, etc. And the reasons for those, those differences in outcomes can be obscured if we just use the term BME as a catch-all. Um, and uh, there is a particular issue here when we, when we, when we, I mean, we were talking there about verbal reasoning tests just then, there is a particular challenge for black applicants in verbal reasoning tests. We don't see the same performance disparities in verbal reasoning tests between um, the, the, the black ap applicants experience compared to um, South, South Asian, East Asian applicants, Middle Eastern applicants. And the danger is that if you're just running adverse impact analysis and you're looking at BME as a whole, you're going to miss out on the, you're going to miss the adverse impact effectively. It's, it's being brushed under the carpet effectively because th there may be certain groups that are impacted more than others. And by using BME as a catch-all term, we're masking that, right? So, so we get to the end of a campaign. And I've seen this happen before. We, we run the adverse impact analysis aligned to BME. Generally speaking, we say, oh, great, there's no adverse impact but then you open up the data and you look underneath it and actually know that there is adverse impact and it's aligned to a specific ethnic group, right? So if we're serious about identifying adverse impact, identifying bias and dealing with it, right? And understanding it, we need to go beyond um, BME. So this is our second action point. Our second call to action is when considering BME adverse impact and bias, it's really important to look beyond that broad label um, the experience of Black British applicants can tell a starkly different story in relation to things like performance in, in verbal reasoning tests compared to other BME eth ethnic groups. Um, so if we're serious about equal opportunity eliminating bias, we need to consider that challenge specifically and go granular where the data allows us to do that. And in emerging talent, that's usually possible because of the high application numbers, right? So we can gain statistically meaningful insights. Um, we don't have to group non-white applicants under one category and then run a, a very kind of shallow level of analysis that hides that masks where the problems really exist um let's talk now around 
another very challenging form of bias in, in, in online assessment that I've, I've seen decade after decade, year after year, which is um, numerical reasoning um, test performance and female applicants. I'm going to hand over to Ray now, who's done a, done a deep dive into this, into this area. Thank you, Jamie. So again, it's important to start by underlining the fact that differences in test performance do not necessarily reflect inherent ability, but they tend to reflect a variety of factors that can influence these outcomes. So let's start about some of the factors that influence female applicants when they complete numerical reasoning tests. So first of all, our old friend stereotype threat. So in a similar way that it impacts BME applicants and verbal reasoning tests, research has shown that stereotype threat where individuals underperform due to the fear of confirming negative stereotypes about their group can negatively impact women's performance in numerical and mathematical tests. Just as an example, a study by Spencer, Steele and Quinn found that when negative stereotypes about women's performance in numerical reasoning are fresh in their mind, they perform worse on the tests. And there is a link um, between that heightened anxiety again and reduced performance repeats because it's very likely that that heightened anxiety is what lies between um, knowing the bias and the, the results as well. There's also the wider society, you know, how often in the world around us are mathematics and numeracy um, casted as male fields. These stereotypes can really discourage women from pursuing studies or careers in these areas, leading to less exposure, less practice with these um, type of tasks. And that's really reflected in educational encouragement as well. So girls may be less encouraged to pursue math intensive subjects or may even receive less reinforcement when they do pursue these kind of tasks and achieve um, really great results in these areas. Now, that can obviously influence their confidence and skills in numerical reasoning. A meta-analysis by Elsquest and their colleagues found that societal factors could explain gender differences in math performance in different countries. Um, and test anxiety. So we keep banging on about this because it's really important. And interestingly, studies have found that women on average tend to experience higher levels of test anxiety compared to men, which can again impact their test performance. Now we're talking about their levels of test anxiety in general, before we even apply stereotype threats to increase those levels, before we look at educational um, encouragement, which again kind of adds to that. Um, and of course, finally, if we want to compound all of these factors, if the test design or the specific questions favor a male perspective or male experiences, then this could further disadvantage female applicants. So the question is, you know, what, what can be done? We're sitting here talking about these um, incredibly wide ranging societal factors, educational factors, things that impact a person's whole life behind the 30 or 60 minutes they sit down to complete an assessment. And, you know, it may sometimes feel like the only option is really to accept defeat and, you know, think that you can't fix a lifetime of disadvantage with just a test. And I, I have personally felt that at times. Um, but what we want to do is to, to challenge that and challenge ourselves in the process as well. We believe assessment providers and test publishers must adapt to the world as it is, unequal with biases, with disadvantage, and really find ways to consider that in their assessments to start leveling the playing field. We believe we need to completely rethink our approach to cognitive assessment if we are serious about removing bias. And Jamie will tell us about the solution that we have found particularly effective in doing that. Yes, so we didn't accept defeat, did we? Um, we've been experimenting with different ways of measuring cognitive ability, um, and, and, and we're going to share one that we found particularly successful um, at removing bias while still being effective as an assessment measure. And um, you know, I just also want to emphasize the importance of this, right? We all know everybody working in the assessment industry and any employer who's seen the data knows that this is a problem and it's a serious problem, right? We know that black people underperform in verbal reasoning tests. We know that females underperform in numerical reasoning tests. Isn't it time we did something about it, right? Rather than designing the same tests over and over again and hoping for different results, which never materialize. So, it does require us to challenge ourselves and think differently, right? We can't fix this by just doing the same thing over and over again. And um, one thing that we've been exploring, and we're going to share um, a little bit of data around um, how we've been doing this, and it's it's so far that the initial data we've seen is, is really promising, is moving to indirect measures of cognitive ability. 
So um, now these won't be suitable for every use case, right? I mean, if you're hiring, for example, you know, an accountant, <laughs> right? You're going to need some direct measure of an analytic ability at some stage in the process. But, but here, what we're really talking about is we're talking about um, where these assessments are used in early careers, volume screening situations to screen out vast numbers of people, and the adverse impact is driving a broad range of negative outcomes. Now, um, an indirect approach to highlighting a candidate's affinity or preference for working with numbers, rather than focusing on raw numerical ability, we found is, is, can be both extremely quick, right, in terms of its delivery, 40 seconds is about all, 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 all we need um, to, to measure that. And what we've also found is it's highly correlated with actual performance in a numerical reasoning test, right? That 0.7, really high, really good correlation. Um, and, and through that indirect measure of, 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 of preference um, and affinity for say, working with numbers in a workplace context, what we've been able to do is hugely reduce the dropout rate, right? Which often adversely impacts certain groups. Um, and eliminate the performance difference between male and female applicants. Now you have to be quite clever with your item design. We put a lot of items into validation to get to this point. Some worked, some didn't. Some still had the adverse impact, others didn't. And what we were looking for were items where there was that strong correlation with actual numerical reasoning ability, but none of the adverse impact. And so this indirect measure of numerical um, um, uh, we call it numerical mindset. It's not a direct measure of numerical reasoning. It's an indirect measure. But as you can see, it is highly correlated. And you know, sure, this is very different to a traditional approach to assessment, but it needs to be. Right? It needs to be different. If we expect to, to drive you know, improvements in accessibility, in fairness, and in diversity outcomes, we have to think differently. There's no, there's no other choice. We've been trying the same thing for decades and getting the same results. Right, it's, it is. It is. I would suggest time to think differently, and this feeds through into our third call to action. If we are serious about eliminating bias and opening up opportunity, we can't keep repeating the same mistakes year after year. We can't take the same approach decade after decade, year after year, and expect different results. It won't happen unless we fundamentally change the way that we assess, and we need to be a bit creative and a bit innovative about that. So our third call to action is this, move to indirect measures of cognitive ability where it's possible to do that, because it will provide a highly correlated measure of ability. Um, interestingly, um, it, it can also tap into preference, a bit like a strengths-based lens on cognitive ability, because one thing that's worth noting about um, cognitive, um, uh, you know, say a numerical reasoning test, is it does test ability for sure, it does not test preference. It does not test enjoyment for working with numbers, right? you can do that with an indirect measure. So in some ways you could argue it's a bit better, right? Because you're getting that lens on, on preference in, in a way that's highly correlated with, with, with ability. Although caveat there, look, if you're hiring somebody who's gonna do lots of deep analysis and so on, you'll want a later stage assessment, perhaps your virtual assessment center or in-person assessment center that measures that. But as an upfront assessment, as an online assessment, this can work fantastically well. Let's now explore um, we mentioned um, you know, three main sources of problematic bias in online assessment, didn't we? We mentioned um, verbal reasoning, um, ethnicity, uh, gender, numerical reasoning. Let's now talk, let's now explore um, SJT type assessments, scenario-based assessments, and the adverse impact we often see aligned to socioeconomic status and the causes of that. And I'll hand over to Maria to do another deep dive. Thank you, Jamie. So I think everyone on this call is familiar with situational judgment tests or SJTs. They are widely used in recruitment to assess an individual's judgment or decision making in job related scenarios. And while these tests aim to be objective and fair, and they are um, as compared to cognitive tests in regards to, um, to certain groups, research indicates that applicants from lower socioeconomic backgrounds may still underperform in these tests for um, some of these reasons. So first of all, it could be a lack of familiarity with work context. SGTs often depict scenarios or dilemmas which are very grounded in professional white collar settings. An individual from lower socioeconomic backgrounds may have less exposure to these contexts, making it harder for them to understand or respond effectively to these kind of challenges. 
Um, there's also a, a question around the access to preparation resources. So SJTs can be prepared for, um, and there are many resources out there available to help individuals improve their performance. Applicants from lower socioeconomic backgrounds may lack the resources to access this kind of preparation material, putting them at a disadvantage. They may also be less likely to attend the kind of school um, or um, education which actually provides them with, with this level of support as part of their courses. There's also a question around test length and fatigue. So we know that longer tests can easily lead to fatigue, which can impair performance. And applicants from lower socioeconomic backgrounds may be particularly susceptible to this if they are balancing multiple responsibility. You know, they could potentially be a carer or they may be working at the same time and have less time to rest or prepare for the test. Um, there's also a question, of course, around socioeconomic bias in, in test content. If the test content subtly favors a middle or upper class perspective or experience, this could very easily disadvantage applicants from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And finally, again, uh, we keep banging on about this because it, it is so impervious to absolutely everything when it comes to assessment, but test anxiety is so important. Research actually shows that Test anxiety can impair performance on high stakes tests and individuals from lower socioeconomic backgrounds may experience high levels of stress and pressure related to these tests, given the greater impact um, of potentially losing or gaining a job opportunity um, and what this means that what this could mean for their lives. Um, there's a lot of studies out there that have linked lower socioeconomic status with higher levels of anxiety, including test anxiety. And one of the most important ones is actually a meta-analysis, um, which is one of the most trustworthy, meaningful studies that you can find. Um, and um, it's a meta-analysis from 2005, which shows that socioeconomic background is a significant predictor of academic achievement. And this was mediated by test anxiety. So basically, if you come from a lower socioeconomic background, you're more likely to have high um, levels of test anxiety in general, and that in turn is associated with lower academic achievement. So once again, we kind of see test anxiety driving adverse impact all over the place for so many different groups. It's such a common thread and one that we should explore in, in more depth. So I'll hand over to... Um, Actually, no, I'm, I'm going to finish this since we're on it. Um, so we could really significantly reduce um, test anxiety, then we can see some real gains in performance for so many of these groups. So we're looking at females that tend to exhibit greater test anxiety in general, uh, but especially in numerical reasoning tests, black individuals experiencing the same in verbal reasoning tests, and those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds in situational judgment tests. So, you know, the question that's on everyone's lips is, okay, okay, Maria, that's awful, but how can we actually reduce this? Well, addressing this issue requires a multi-pronged approach. Um, first of all, we need to recognize it happens, done, um, but then also we need to look at measures to adjust assessment protocols and scoring algorithms. So one of the measures Jamie has already um, talked about, um, we recommend looking at indirect measures for NRTs and VRTs, which will um, induce much lower levels of test anxiety. Um, and this could also assess these abilities in a more contextual or integrated manner to help alleviate this. So, for example, instead of isolating numerical or verbal reasoning tasks in their own abstract test, these skills can be evaluated as part of broader problem solving or critical thinking tasks. Um, we also, you know, want to urge you to consider alternatives to situational judgment tests. While they can provide valuable insights, um, they can also be very time consuming and as a result, stress inducing, particularly for some of these individuals that we've mentioned. As an alternative, you could consider shorter, more focused behavioral assessments or immersive job related tasks that provide a realistic job preview at the same time. But even with these changes, remember what I said, some of these individuals simply have higher anxiety to, to start with when it comes to tests. So it's essential to go beyond that and incorporate scoring algorithms that can detect signs of test anxiety. So we could be looking at inconsistent um, response patterns or unusually long response times and then adjust the scores accordingly. And by doing so, these algorithms can really help to level the playing field and hopefully accurately reflect an individual's potential rather than their level of, of test anxiety. Um, 
we know that this is quite a different approach. It's a much more holistic, much more adaptive approach to psychometric assessment. But we do believe that this can help promote fairness and inclusivity and hopefully lead to much more diverse and effective workforces. I think our focus as, as practitioners and, you know, many, many of our clients have exactly the same focus should always be on enabling all individuals to do their best, um, regardless of their background or circumstances. So Jamie is now going to tell us a bit more about these dynamically adaptive scoring algorithms and how they um they could help yeah thank you maria um so i think you know this this webinar was marketed as um you know applying artificial intelligence to eliminate bias this is where we kind of get to the heart of that particular topic um so th there is a, a a slight misconception about ai and, and, and bias i mean well, it's not really a misconception it's, it's it's accurate to a degree which is that ai is is bad from a a, a bias and um, diversity perspective and the reason for that assertion and it's true, is that if you adopt the classic approach to um, training scoring algorithms using AI, so big external data set trains your algorithms, you then use those algorithms to score candidates, that, that is going to inherently um, be problematic because there is no such thing as a bias-free training data set. Or is there? Um, now, we, we don't adopt that approach to AI, by the way. There's a misconception that we do. We don't. We don't train our algorithms on large external data sets for exactly that reason, right? In the same way that we don't use norm groups for exactly that reason. Um, this is the approach that we use, and we find it highly effective. So as people go through our assessments, um, we analyze how they're making their decisions. We do that in a variety of, of different ways. We collect a lot of data in a short space of time. We then use that data to train the scoring algorithms live during the assessment. The candidate trains their own algorithm effectively, delivering a dynamically adaptive algorithm, which accounts for differences in decision-making style, decision confidence, um, anxiety levels, neuropsychology, including disabilities. And the impact of that is that we're able to deliver um, bias-free insights. On the methodological level, this is an inherently bias-free approach to scoring because the candidate is training their own algorithm. Now, it was this approach, um, incidentally, which enabled us, I've got it right here, keep it on my desk, um, which enabled us to win this, <laughs> the Commitment to Improving Diversity Award 2023 from the ISE in partnership with the NHS. Um, and that, that was part of that award submission, right? We're using these dynamically adaptive algorithms which identify individual differences, accommodate them very effectively, um, and, and, and the scoring adapts as a, as a result. Um, so, so this feeds through into um, another call to action. When we're talking about assessments, we can't ignore the pernicious influence of norm groups, right? Uh, or um, scoring algorithms trained on large external data sets, pretty much the same thing, really. Um, so, um, now, it, it, using one size fits all scoring algorithms can lead to a significant challenge. And these conventional algorithms fail to account for the diversity of individual decision making styles, test levels of test anxiety. Um, and, and the issue with these, with these classical approaches, such as norm groups and, and training your algorithms on large external data sets, is that they effectively penalize individuals who differ from the norm, right? That the very phrase norm group is problematic when you think about diversity and neurodiversity. Um, the norm is often, often um, based on the majority group. Um, it will be neurotypical individuals, mostly white individuals, um, quite often middle class, um, quite often in employment. Um, and as a result, those from underprivileged backgrounds, neurodiverse individuals, racial minorities may be systematically disadvantaged through those algorithms. Um, and, and the solution to us lies through um, um, dynamically adaptive AI powered scoring algorithms, which can account for individual differences and effectively accommodate them. So um, this is our fifth call to action, really, um, that um, stop using norm groups, right, to score candidates, stop using percentiles, um, it, stop the training of algorithms on large external data sets with the imported bias that that brings. Um, if we're serious about leveling the playing field, we need to dynamically adapt scoring algorithms to an individual's decision-making style, their confidence levels, their anxiety levels. We need to be able to dynamically lean into that and adapt the algorithms in real time to that individual to deliver fair 
outcomes. Um, so in summary then, um, these are the kind of five calls to actions that we've outlined during our conversation um, today, our insight session today. Um, the first is that we would encourage employers and the assessment industry to accept that the four-fifths rule of adverse impact is insufficiently ambitious, and we should aspire to remove statistically meaningful differences between mi minority and majority groups. The second call to action is that when we're looking at adverse impact from the BME perspective, analyze the performance of each ethnicity that comprises BME. There will often be significant performance differences, and it is not uncommon to see black applicants significantly impacted more so than say South Asian or, or East Asian applicants, although it's important to look at that at the granular level. The third call to action is consider moving to indirect measures of verbal and numerical reasoning you know, verbal and numerical reasoning tests are just, I mean, when it comes from a DEI perspective, they're a nightmare, right? They, they've driven adverse impact against certain groups for so long. For so long, it's well beyond time we did something about it. And we do have to be a bit creative, a bit innovative, but it's worth it in the end if we, we're serious about eliminating bias. Um, our fourth call to action is do everything possible to, to eliminate anxiety, right, in the assessments. And, it, and um, that will deliver... If we're successful in doing that, um, reducing anxiety will deliver diversity benefits aligned with socioeconomic status, disability, gender, um, um, ethnicity. One thing that we've hopefully made clear through this insight session is test anxiety is a highly pernicious influence that negatively impacts a broad range of individuals in various assessments. The, the, the lower we can get that anxiety level, the better. And um, the fifth call to action, which relates to that, is we can't remove it, we need to accommodate it. Right? We need to develop dynamically adaptive algorithms that can accommodate various levels of test anxiety and give people an equal opportunity to demonstrate their strengths. Stop using norm groups. Stop using one-size-fits-all scoring algorithms. That is our fifth call to action. And all of this is possible today. Right. So to conclude on a, on a positive and constructive note, together, right, employers, assessment providers, um, you know, we have the tools and the knowledge at the disposal to improve accessibility, fairness, and diversity outcomes today. We don't have to accept the way things have always been and the outcomes that we see again and again and again, right? Um, removing bias and promoting true diversity doesn't have to be an aspirational goal of the far distant future, right? There are real tangible actions that we can take. And those five action points, by the way, we've been living by those five action points for the last couple of years. Right. And, and the outcomes that we see as a result of living by those action points, those calls to action, is that you know, by, by, by aspiring to go beyond the fourth fifth rule, not hiding behind it as a kind of cop out, right, to, 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 to look at ethnic performance at the granular level, to pioneer measures of indirect assessment of numerical and verbal reasoning, to commit to reducing test anxiety and, and accommodating it through adaptive scoring algorithms, the effect of those combined um, action points is very significant. And the real world data that we see is that we are able to attain a less than 1% performance difference between minority and majority groups with improved accessibility. And it doesn't stop at fairness, right? By, by adopting these approaches, what we found is that we can actually deliver better assessment. So there doesn't need to be, you know, this isn't a, a zero sum game where if we improve fairness, we reduce uh, accuracy. Actually, both can be improved very significantly by adopting um, those approaches. And what this hopefully demonstrates is that if we raise our levels of ambition, if we embrace innovation and we commit to making assessment and selection fairer from the ground up, we can achieve great things together. And we're proud, we're proud to have been focusing on this for the last few years. And we invite you, assessment providers, um, employers, to join us on this, this crusade in, in, in moving assessment and selection towards a future where true fairness is the norm and not the exception. And on that note, um, we will conclude and open for questions. I hope that was interesting. Thank you both. Uh, definitely interesting. Um, yeah, I wish to stop till there are a lot of questions, obviously. We have 15 minutes, so um, I'm definitely not going to get to all of them. And some of them are kind of very quick answers from you, I would think. So some of them will be a bit meatier. Let's see how we get on. And um, I'm going to just scroll back up to the top. Um, 
so a comment, I'm not sure we'll get to the why we think this is, but um, a comment that a lot of black candidates also fall short at numerical reasoning. So I know you chose that as an example, but I'm sure there's an acknowledgement that that's, you know, that there are other crossover there. And the person who asked it would, would like some discussion about why we think this is. I think maybe we can pop that into a diversity conversation at some point. Um, if there's any evidence uh, for that, I think it would be really useful if you guys could share that. Um, Julie's asking if there are more recent, so it's probably one for you, Maria, the more recent studies relative to women's performance and the notions of the stereotype threat, um, just because there's been so much more work on raising aspirations for women in STEM-based roles, and just wondered if there were more contemporary views um, on whether the studies you've looked at do kind of reflect that. Are you aware of anything? Yeah, I actually haven't seen a lot of recent studies at, at the same kind of level of quality to, to show this. And I do think with, with these, the kind of work that has been done in, in the last years, absolutely, it's, it's commendable. And I genuinely think we should do so much more of it. But I do think is the kind of work where the difference is going to be seen with time, um, because although there is there is still work that is done kind of at different touch points for these um, for these female students, for example, you know, there's still the wider society that is telling them something else. Um, so um, we'll definitely have like, you know, continuously to kind of see if there's any any new studies, but I would I would expect the results to kind of be seen later on in terms of research then then immediately um jamie have you seen anything else would you add anything no the only thing i i, I would add is that um you know our, our understanding of these issues didn't stem from academic research it, it really stemmed from from real world exposure to developing and validating and seeing the real world outcomes of embedded online assessment solutions in a broad range of early careers employers and that's where a lot of the of, of the um our awareness of the challenges um, arose. Um, I think, as Maria mentioned quite rightly at the beginning of the, of the session, um, while that highlights the, um, the 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 what of what is happening, right? That there is there are these these performance issues. It doesn't sufficiently highlight the how, and that's hopefully what we've been covering today. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a yeah. it's a complex and evolving um, topic for sure. It is indeed, and I'm sure there will be, you know, increased uh, research. It takes time to put together these research projects and to do meta-analysis and all the rest of it. So let's hope things are moving forward on that, which is great. Um, there's a couple of questions. This is a bit meatier, um, but, you know, two minutes or less. Uh, what actually is an indirect assessment, uh, mm. numerical or otherwise? I think people are kind of really struggling to get their heads around, you know, what can you actually do in 40 seconds when you when you're talking about the numerical ones yeah and how would is there other ways of adapting direct assessments how would you go about adapting yeah. your direct assessment to an indirect one so a little elaboration on that would be helpful yeah yeah sure so so a quite a good lens to approach this at is the preference based lens right given a choice of different tasks or different projects or different responsibilities what do people naturally gravitate towards we tend to gravitate towards the things that we're good at and we like doing right? Very much the strength-based lens on performance. So if you can ascertain that through focus questions during an assessment, which are aligned to the application of numerical reasoning ability in the workplace, you can get a good sense for how people would gravitate to a sort of task and how they would feel about them. So an indirect measure would tap into that. And what we found through our research is that, you know, we, 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 um, we validated, um, you know dozens and dozens and dozens of items to get to you know some that actually worked really well in that regard and what they do is is they reveal both preference for working with numbers in the workplace um what they also show is people's um it's 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 highly correlated with their actual ability because we don't gravitate towards tasks that we're not good at um so um so that that would be an example of an indirect measurement so that's that leads me on to the next question actually which is you know this is all relatively new um mm. so how do you know that it directly um, aligns to predictability in the role? How, yeah. how do you know that performance is actually related, to, you know, is indicated by these indirect tests? Yeah, so I think there's, there's probably two slightly separate questions there. One is how do we know if it's directly related to um, verbal reasoning ability? And the answer is we put people through um, um, a reasoning test, an actual test, and then we, we validated these um, indirect measurements, these items, and we looked at the correlation between the two. Um, the other question is, how, how do we know if it predicts performance in role? Well, we don't. It depends on the role. So the question of whether you would want to measure 
verbal reasoning or numerical reasoning is a question that will be determined before you build an assessment, right, or an assessment process. Is it important? Do you need to measure it? And what we would encourage quite often when you look at the history of verbal reasoning, numerical reasoning tests, they've been used just to get the numbers down, right? They haven't been used because they're actually job critical skills. Um, I mean, you, you can say that they're helpful, but in, 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 in many um, roles, the, the, the most that candidates will do when it comes to numerical reasoning is a bit of work in Excel, right? They're not gonna sit there manually doing the kind of calculations you do in a numerical reasoning test most of the time. Now, for some roles, obviously that is important. For many, it is not critical. There'll be more important things that you'll want to measure. So the question of does it predict performance in role will very much depend on the role. And it will very much depend on whether that the expression of that, that, that preference and that ability is aligned to, to greater success in role. And that's something that will be determined before the assessment process is designed um, so that you can account for that. Just to build on that as well, we would also look at this through the validation. So once we have designed mm. the items, we would run the typical validation with our clients, see how that correlates with performance, um, you know, whatever kind of criteria that means for the, the client. And again, that would be a collaborative process of identifying what is the the actual criteria we're trying to, to yeah. you know, predict um, in terms of the assessment. And we would be working together at that um, on that in terms of collecting, looking at the data and evaluating the results. Yeah. And if, you know, if, if it doesn't predict performance in role, don't measure it. Right. It's no point. So um, so and we'd actively encourage employers to remove numerical reasoning tests if it isn't aligned to in job performance and the realities of the job that they'll be doing. No, but I think the question was if we're if we're switching direct assessment to indirect and numerical skills are relevant in the role, yeah, yeah. then they would want to know that there was a predictor in there. But yeah. there's a follow-up question to this, which is if you're saying what you did say, that um, you know, you're looking for indicators within that indirect assessment at the beginning or preferences or strengths. And then if you are saying you do need a high level of numerical skills, that mm. there should be a further test. Yeah. How can you be sure you're not re-interested, re, uh, sort of introducing bias at that point? Yeah. So um, what's interesting about this is when you look at performance in assessment centers aligned to things like analytical exercises, you don't often you don't see the adverse impact a lot of the time. So so um that that's that's the fascinating thing about it, because the kind of analysis exercise you might undertake in a final stage assessment process is very different in feel and character to a time-limited or time-recorded numerical reasoning test and the kind of items that presents in the abstract. Um, so while numerical reasoning tests, we, we, we know adversely impact female candidates, we don't see that same level of adverse impact in well-designed and, and stage assessments. So it's possible to, 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 to have that robust measure um, and not reintroduce that adverse impact. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. I'm just scrolling through because there's more coming up as we go on, and I'm also keeping an eye on time. Um, there is a comment from from Phil in here, which you know there are, if done well, positive diversity outcomes for online testing. So I think you know, it's, it's not always the case that things are particularly negative. And and Phil saying within civil service, you know, there's bespoke. Uh, situation judgment tests, the style questionnaires, there's other things that um, can really give positive results in there. So I think we need to acknowledge that it's not it's not all bad in their space, um, if done well, if done well. Um, that's fine. Uh, there's a question about, I think this is, this is an interesting one. You talked a lot about the anxiety levels and the impact on performance. Um, examples of how you can meaningfully reduce that. I mean, it, any test, even the ones we're talking about here, if you're mm. from a certain background or have a certain characteristics, then, you know, anxiety levels are high. Any thoughts yeah. on how to helpfully, meaningfully reduce that level of anxiety? Yeah, so, I mean, we've, we've developed some, I mean, Neurosight was founded in 2019 to create a form of assessment that that, that didn't induce anxiety, in the world, among other things, and remove bias. And the way that we've approached it is um, the the... Um, the assessment itself um, includes things like a warm-up activity, right, before you get into the into the real assessed items. It, it feels very straightforward to complete. It doesn't feel difficult to complete, even though we're getting a lot of useful information. It doesn't feel like you're being put through the ringer. Um, so it is possible through through smart design to develop assessments that don't feel stressful to complete. Um, and that that is helpful. However, we must acknowledge that test anxiety 
will, will nonetheless exist, even if the assessment has been designed not to be stressful. Um, and, and that's why we also have to pair it with adaptive algorithms that can identify that, right? So that you're, you're not being penalized for having a different way of expressing your decision confidence because your nerves are high. Um, and, and that, so that it, it's about the pairing of both the, the, the assessment design itself with those adaptive algorithms, but it, without that pairing, you can't really fully address the issue. Um, so it's, 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 it's the two together. Okay. And there was a point earlier around, um, you, you mentioned about taking the time, the, a longer time to answer, particularly in numerical reasoning tests, maybe yeah. an indicator of heightened anxiety, but we don't know that no. at that point. It could be anything else going on in there, including chat GPT potentially. So it, it's, it's tricky to, as always in these cases, attribute everything to one thing, right? There's, there's yeah, a lot and, of nuance in all of this. Right. And we, it's not a diagnostic tool, right? We're not putting people no. through the assessments and saying, oh, you have a, a, um, a response pattern that's outside the norm because you're anxious or because you're dyslexic or because you're dyspraxic, et cetera. What we do see is that there is a response pattern that is outside the norm. We don't know why that is, but we're going to account for it and adjust anyway, right? To, to ensure that they're not disadvantaged for whatever the reason is behind that response pattern. Okay, lovely, thanks. Um, and a question or a request really for a, a bit more detail on how you measure accuracy overall, I guess. Um, so that's a very broad question. <laughs> it is a very broad yeah. question. And, yeah. uh, but it was it was at the point at which we started doing the Q&A. So I think it's just, I, I'm guessing it's a correlation question. So how, how are you how are you measuring the accuracy of your Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Into... yeah. Sorry, Sorry yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, so so um, we we adopt the same um, you know, if if an employer has ever gone through a process of building and validating a bespoke online assessment, that's the process that we go through, right? So it starts with job analysis. Are we measuring the right things for the right reasons? The assessment is built to measure those things, and the assessment is then validated, right? So it's validated on internal employee pool, typically up to one hundred people or so. If not, we use a panel provider to get the numbers. Um, and it's through that validation process, which, um, you know, is, is aligned to industry best practice, that we would establish the accuracy of the tool in much the same way as you would for any bespoke online assessment tool. Lovely. Thanks. Um, OK, I'm just having a quick look. I think we've covered quite a lot of this. Um, the question from Holly, if you're not using percentiles and norms, how is it used for efficient screening? How is a cut score set? I'll admit, I don't know what a cut score is, um, yeah. not being in the assessment world, but you do. Yeah. So uh, how do you do that? Yeah, well, you don't need to use a norm group to generate a score, right? Um, so so the whole concept of a norm group is that you're, you're judging people's um, uh, performance and assessment relative to other people that isn't necessary to generate a score so in an assessment there will be desirable and less desirable responses right and wrong responses so the assessment will be built to measure the critical drivers of success in role and you can measure performance against that you don't need to compare that candidate to anyone else in order to do that it's not necessary so um you know that that's that's the the fairly straightforward answer to that question you just don't need to use norm groups right if you, if you the, the, it's a different way of thinking about assessments not how 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 are you compared to other people right that doesn't necessarily tell you whether they're good at the job right it's it's how you know are are you providing the responses that we're looking for in the right way with high degrees of confidence um you know are you are you demonstrating the strengths the behaviors the cognitive traits that we want to see that we know drive success and we can apply scoring on that basis, on an individual basis. Um, and so we, we, have, we, we have no issue setting cutoff scores or anything like that. We don't need to use non-groups to to, to, in order to do that. Okay, lovely. And you mentioned using existing employing data. So this is the, the last point. If you are using existing employee data, how do you then avoid bringing existing bias back into the process? Yeah, so the only context in which we'd use existing employee data is when we're validating to establish the validity of the tool. Um, the, what we what we term the the criterion or the construct validity. Um, so um, that's that 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 is a, an exercise that's conducted outside of the scoring process that's used for the assessment. Um, so so that, that you know it's not it's not going to wash over and cause bias in the actual assessment itself. 
Sure. Thank you. We'll stop there. Um, there's, there's much more detail in some of those questions, and I know that you'll you'll have access to that and you'll take a look. I mean, it's, it's not surprising. Thank you, everybody, for putting those questions in. Uh, you know, this is a new area. There's a lot of questions. There's, there's you know, a, there's a wider desire in the industry where you started out in this conversation to reduce bias overall. And, you know, we, we're an industry that is really supportive of those aims definitely and what you've talked through today is just you know as I say lots of questions really interesting to people thank you both for your time and your insight um, everybody's looking forward to getting the slides so they can reflect on this and I'm sure if there are questions that people have that we have not answered yet you'll be really happy to have those directed towards you and to follow up so we'll leave it there thank you everybody for joining us and um, we will follow up when we can. Have a lovely rest of your Thursday and heading towards the weekend. We're not that far away. So have a great rest of the week. We'll see you soon. Thank you.